Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's session. Today, we'll be talking about the latest LM-based model to solve the Minecraft environment. The name is Jarvis One, the open-world multitask agent with memory augmented multimodal language models. Um, so it actually sounds very big. The main thing is compared to previous models like Voyager and those in the Minecraft, what they did was that they used images as input. And they also store this image in the memory so that you can retrieve those images. <clears throat> so let's let's take a look at how, how they solve it. So like, for example, let's take a look at this, uh, how to craft a wooden pickaxe. So let's see. So you can see as the video runs, the top left task is the main task is wooden pickaxe. Um, the environment input is this this entire RGB pixel of the entire screen. Nothing has changed. Okay, including, <clears throat> including the health bars and everything. All these will be the inputs. The position will be given separately. And then there's a goal. You can see this there's this sub goals planning. So like now they want to go to crafting table. And then after that, craft the steak and so on. So you can see all these mouse actions and everything. Okay. Based on this goal, there will be a prompt given to the controller. Like for example, craft wooden pickaxe and so on. And the controller will need to interpret the environment inputs and map it down to mouse actions or keyboard actions. So this is one. I mean, we can take a look at another one. Like, so you can see again, this is the goal. There's this goal over here that is basically based on the planner. You break down the task of uh, the wooden pickaxe into separate manageable goals. Like over here, the goal is to get the birch lock, then create the birch planks, all right? And then create the crafting table. So, so this is just an example that like you can see this idea of creating the wooden pickaxe in different environments. You have different ways of creating it. And Jarvis one, because of the way it's trained, I'll explain how it's trained later, is able to achieve some diversity here and still fulfill the goal, okay, regardless of the starting environment that is in. So this is Minecraft for you. All right, I'm going to go to my slides now. Okay, maybe you give me a thumbs up if you can see the slides. This is the slides for Jarvis one with this verdict over here. Anyone, can you all see the slides? All right, great. Okay, thanks, David. So over here, I would like to say that in terms of what I feel about Jarvis one, I think it's very cool that they use the image input because as you already know, the image input is very high dimensional. A lot of pixels, each pixel has like two, five, six colors in red, green, blue, some even count transparency, all right? And there's also a lot of pixels. So the in input space for images is huge. Okay, how exactly are they going to process this input space, all right? The previous versions of the large language model solving Minecraft, they crafted everything in text. And based on text, you process it. That's a much more manageable space. How then? Does Jarvis one use images for the planning? All right. So that's one thing to look at. But overall, I feel like their planning process could improve. All right. I'll explain why later. Let's dive in. So anyone here has heard of Voyager? Just give me a show of hands. Who has heard of Voyager? A Voyager was the previous model that uses large language models to solve the Minecraft environment. And they are one of the first few to use this thing called the automatic curriculum, where the LM will suggest, based on a pool of tasks, which tasks are more manageable based on what tasks have been completed and what tasks have not. All right. So actually, this Jarvis one also uses something similar to the automatic curriculum. Next, we have the skill learning. And how this skill learning is done is through prompting through the Minecraft wiki, like in order to craft the stone soup. Stones what you need, what ingredients and so on, what materials. You can actually give that as knowledge. Okay, and then give some example programs and ask it to generate, few shot generate a program. Like for example, this is the combat zombie program. Okay, in order to uh in order to create this program, what they need to do is they also need to use other things. Like for example, if you have other things you have done before, like craft stone sword, you might refer to your memory bank and take out this program, craft stone sword or craft shoe. So in some sense, this kind of thing, all right, is like the more you solve tasks, okay, because after you solve the task, you can actually add it to the skill bank. The more you solve the task, the more reference functions you have, and then you can compose it into a more complicated function. And this is the idea of learning in Voyager. 
the ability to generate more and more complex functions based on what you have in your memory bank, which is basically your skill library. So this idea of getting better and better at the environment by gaining more skills, I think this is something interesting. And also this is something that I tried to do for the ARC challenge as well. Like I was try I was think thinking about this idea. Uh, however, the ARC challenge is not as straightforward as Voyager. Uh, sorry, it's not as straightforward as Minecraft. Because in Minecraft, maybe the kind of actions you need to do is quite fixed. Like you need to um, attack the zombie, you need to craft items, you need to move here and move there. Uh, in the ARC challenge, uh, it's like the IQ test for computers. Like you give us an input grid to output grid, you need to find the rules to map them. Um, it's not as obvious how to get this actions. <laughs> the action space is not obvious. So um, one downfall of this skill stuff is that if you cannot learn the skill, you cannot learn anything. So, so, so this is, um, you see, student only remembers good stuff. So uh, in Jarvis 1, they don't have this skill um, prompting thing. Um, but what they have is they have memories of the entire uh, experience. And you can leverage that memory to do plans. Okay. Let's take a look at the other one. So this is the other paper that I covered uh, uh, last time. It's called Goals in the Minecraft. And I like this paper a lot. Okay, even more than Voyager, actually, because I think they got quite a lot of things right. So one thing that they did was sub-goal decomposition. So it's like given a goal, like for example, to craft a wooden sword. Maybe I need to first find the wood. I need to chop the trees first and so on. So you can actually, based on the Minecraft wiki, you can you can basically decompose your main goal into sub-goals. Okay, and this um, is also why the Minecraft environment might be a bit too easy. Okay, because it's uh, quite obvious what items based on a certain item the path to craft it is obvious there's no like stochasticity or, or anything is it's just basically you just need to fulfill your end goals and then you can you can slowly fulfill the main goal but this lends us to this idea that if you decompose into sub goals and solve them you can solve the main goal all right and this is what this decomposer does okay later you see Jarvis one they also did something similar they decompose it okay and then based on this LM planner you map it into some structured actions. Okay, so this is what I would like to call as a domain specific language. Because based on the Minecraft domain, you have certain functions that you do, like explore, mine, craft, dig. So all these actions, um, you just need to map, okay, from this set of sub goals into a set of structured actions. So for example, maybe the goal is to craft the wooden sword, you can do something like explore then you can go to like tree and then like um you, you can craft sword so, so you can give it a list a sequence of functions here and you can execute the sequences of functions um within a structure action is perfect execution so it is already hard coded in a, a set of structure actions to basically get you the environment uh, to, to basically do in the environment to fulfill the goal and later you can see that um it's this part here okay is this part here that Jarvis 1 doesn't do well in because Jarvis 1 uses a controller to directly map to keyboard and mouse. So that is it's not hard coded. So I would say Jarvis 1 got most of this pathway correct. All right. Um, just at the last part, because they tried to do a direct link to the keyboard and mouse, they didn't learn that part that well. And honestly, the paper isn't very well written. They, they don't even explain how they train the controller. So this controller part is the downfall of Jarvis 1. Okay, so if they actually could incorporate some elements of what this goes in the Minecraft did, they I I am quite sure that the Minecraft bot would be superhuman <laughs> because, because it's already doing things quite well. This is the last part. So this is quite quite an important point. All right. How do we train? Okay, in a learning system, how do we train all these components together? Because right now in previous systems, like for example, in Ghost in the Minecraft, all these things are given. How do we learn this? I think we haven't solved this part yet. Okay, but how to use the LM to map into actions? I think this part here, we more or less know how to do it, at least for Minecraft. All right, so one um, pitfall of earlier methods is that they use stuff like LiDAR rays, like the laser rays in the game to detect um like objects and you know sometimes this um inadvertently leads to some cheating because your know, race can go through some blocks sometimes okay they try to avoid it but you know sometimes you, you can still do it 
So the idea is because they want to make everything into text back then. Uh, so using LIDAR arrays, you can describe like what, what voxels you got, what blocks you got, what are their characteristics and so on. Everything is in text. So you can use the large language model to process it. Okay. However, this is not very realistic because in real life, you don't really have laser beams telling you, hey, this the door is over here, 270 degrees from me, you know, that kind of thing. Um, you, you don't have this kind of thing. What we have in real life, if we are talking about an embodied agent, we have our vision sensor. And also maybe you have your uh, those kind of sensory motor stuff where you, you already know like your head is tilted, how many degrees and so on. So you have all these internal sensors, but you won't have laser beams telling you where, where they are. Okay. So I think this is the one of the first steps. Okay, what Jarvis one is doing is one of the first steps to lead us into better embodied agents. So let's move. To, okay, so before we move into Jarvis one, I just want to highlight that in Ghost in the Minecraft, all right, they actually did much better. Okay, they have diamond pickaxe. Just looking at the diamond pickaxe stars to craft it. Ghost in the Minecraft. If you look at this little bar here, okay, I know it's a bit hard to see. It's about 50% success rate if you read off here. Okay, compared to like VPT is the open AI model to train from videos. Okay, VPT is about 6% success rate. Okay, so in this paper, in Jarvis one, they got 12.5% success rate. Better than VPT, but not as good as goes in the Minecraft. Okay, and the reason I explained already is because the controller is the letdown. So previously goes in the Minecraft, they use structured actions. VPT doesn't. I'm <laughs> sorry, um, Jarvis one doesn't. But however, the whole Jarvis one process of the memory part, I think we can learn some stuff from it. Okay, so let's move on to the and uh to Jarvis one. Okay, uh, actually before I, I touch on what is Jarvis one, um, you have any questions on uh, Voyager and Ghost in the Minecraft? Because um, these are like the foundations for what we are going to talk about today. All, all good. All right, so I'm going to talk about Jarvis 1 now. So Jarvis 1, um, what they do is, actually, they don't do full end-to-end -end training. Similar to, like, Voyager and Ghost in the Minecraft, they actually take, like, pre-trained language models. Okay, over here is a pre-trained multimodal language model. So there's this model called MindClip, okay, which actually interprets Minecraft images. All right. So they actually use this, which already pre-trained with lots of Minecraft images and so on. And um, this basically helps to map an image to an embedding space quite well. All right. Uh, for the language model, they still use GPT-4. Uh, they also use open source models like Llama 2, which uh, didn't work too well. So GPT-4 is still better. All right. So in terms of uh, what they did, all right, they basically use the pre-trained models to interpret images and text. Okay, and, and do planning based on large language models. And the plan, eventually this plan will be in a sequence of actions. And this sequence of actions will form like sub goals, like for example, uh, craft, uh, craft, craft uh, the crafting table. That, that could be a sub goal. And then the goal condition controller will then map to a series of steps based on keyboard and mouse. Right. The other thing is that Jarvis One has this thing called the multimodal memory, which basically stores in images and text. So later you'll see they also do some form of retrieval, like something like retrieval augmented generation. And this allows them to leverage on the memory to make better decisions. And this memory also allows self-improvement. I, I like this a lot. I like this a lot because um, I always believe memory is learning. If you look at all my other videos and what I've talked about, I think the key to creating fast adaptable agents is to improve the way we store and retrieve the memory. So Jarvis One has taken the first step there. I'm like only 20% satisfied with what they did. I'll explain why the 80% why I'm not satisfied. But the idea of putting both image and text in the memory and using that to condition the plan, I think that's a very nice idea. And you can see that one of the huge breakthroughs that Jarvis One did is that they don't even hard code the functions needed. Okay, so unlike goes in the Minecraft, there's no hard coded uh action, uh action to like keyboard and mouse. Okay, for Voyager is a bit different because Voyager uses a code. Okay, they use a Minecraft bot, so that one we don't compare. But in terms of uh how we interact with the environment, this Jarvis One is the most native. Okay, and also the most, I I would say it's quite hard to train it. 
So it, it's quite amazing that they achieve quite good performance, even without hard coding quite a lot of things. So I would say quite a lot of things to, to learn from this paper. Okay, questions so far on Jarvis one? All right. So before I move on to talk about the details of Jarvis one, I just like to touch on the similarities with my, like this is, I will consider this my live research. So this is called learning fast and slow. And basically the idea okay, is that we need memory, all right? Because neural networks take very long time to learn. If you take a neural network to train okay, on something, you realize you need multiple epochs before the weights are updated to reflect upon the new stuff. But however, if you use memory, memory is instant. You can use it straight away to, to condition your plan and so on. So over here, I propose goal-directed learning, which is also what Jarvis one did. Everything is based on goals. The controller uses goal-directed conditioning. The plans, you have a main goal and then you de decompose into sub-goals. All these are great. So you can see that the idea behind fast and slow is that you have this kind of, um, this is the memory part. You have the end state, you have the start state. So for example, if you want to go from state one to state three, you sample your memory. Okay, maybe you get one from state one to state two, and then you sample again from state two to state three. So you know that, okay, um, based on these two samplings, I can go from state one to state three via state two. Okay, if this is the faster, the fastest path, I block off all other paths, and then basically I get self-improvement here by choosing the shortest path. Okay, so um, this is something that I'm saying here right now because Jarvis one doesn't do this. Okay, so I think they are missing out on this part. Okay, if we could do this, I, I'm, I'm quite sure we can improve Jarvis one even more. Right? So this is the idea behind this uh, learning fast and slow is using memory to do self-improvement, using memory for fast learning. And if there's some path in memory, you override the neural network action, okay, which is more like the system one, the gut view kind of pathway. So um, again, I'm not going to go in detail for this, but keep this framework in mind as we review this paper because this uh, Jarvis one has gotten some components of memory right, okay, but they don't have the full picture yet. Okay, I, I don't think Jarvis one system is, 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 is the, the way to solve it, okay, but they have given us the first steps. So how do we look at like the, the capabilities of the agent? Okay, one way is to look at whether they can craft the technology tree. So in this case, technology tree is like the items that are crafted. So you can see over here that they managed to craft quite a lot of items. Like in fact, they crafted the entire thing in the overworld. Like overworld is the world above the ground because there's also the nether world in Minecraft, which is uh like you need to craft a nether portal and so on. Um, so over here you can see that all the diamond stuff they managed to craft it. And um, maybe sometimes it's like six percent success rate and so on. Um, for all these items here, it's like almost hundred percent success rate. These basic wooden items and so on. So you can see in order to craft it, you need certain prerequisites. And this solving the entire tech tree is not easy because sometimes the dependencies go like 10 steps. You can, you can see the arrows. And um, over here, goals in the Minecraft actually solve everything also because they use sub goal decomposition. And then if your sub goals can all work, you will solve the main goal. Okay, here, they also solve everything, but not as high success rate as goals in the Minecraft. And the key downfall is actually the controller. But the fact that you can unlock the entire tech tree is already quite impressive and highlights the usefulness of sub-goal planning. Okay, first thing that we're going to talk about in uh, Jarvis one is called situation-aware planning. So actually, situation-aware planning sounds very complicated. Uh, the main thing is basically updating the plan. <laughs> updating the plan based on what you see in your environment. So if you only have a GPT-based planner that only produces the plans at the beginning and don't change the plan at all, okay, you'll find that most times you will fail because what will happen is you might want a certain plan at the beginning, but you know sometimes the environment doesn't have it. If let's say you want to hunt the ship, but there's no ship in the plane, then how are you going to do it? You can't. You need to update your plans accordingly. You need to say, hey, there's no ship here. Maybe I should go somewhere else to try to find one. Okay, But if you plan only at the beginning, Okay, you, you may not, you, you may not work. Okay, maybe let me ask a question, okay. Um, let's say you want to achieve a certain goal in life. Like for example, maybe you want to, to, to retire in 10 years, right? How many of you here think that 
whatever plan you have now will still be the plan you you will you will continue to do in five years time. Anyone who who is absolutely certain the plan you have for your life right now would be the same five years from now. Like you will still do the same plan. Anyone? Okay, how many of you think that the plan that you have for your life will change in five years? Anyone? Just raise your hand. No, no response. Okay, can, can I, okay yes. Sumet, you say yes. Anyone else think that the plan that you have for your life? Okay, yes, answer also. So this is the same idea, all right? You don't want to have a static plan. You don't want this plan to just be there at the beginning and just execute the whole plan because environment may be different from what you think it is because when you do your planning, you try to as far as possible, maybe simulate the future a bit, but you will never be sure. So as an experiment to compare this, I think this is quite obvious, but as an experiment to compare this in the game of Minecraft, all right, what we do is we do a situation aware, which is Jarvis 1, and we do a non-situation aware, which is just using GPT to generate the plan and not update the plan at all. So you can see that for the obtain the diamond, a human is able to do it like with 12% success rate in about 10 minutes. Okay, Jarvis 1 needs a bit more time because of exploration, so it takes about 60 minutes. But a GPT with no update to the plan at all has 0% success rate. So you know diamond is a very difficult task to get because you need to go like a few layers down from the surface. You need to go into the kit to, to the underground and the diamond ores are not exactly in the same place all the time. You need to adapt your plan accordingly. 0% if you don't adapt the plan at all. So that's quite harsh. All right. Crafting the stone, iron, and diamond tasks. You can see that if you don't update your plan, actually the stone not bad, you still get 20% success rate. But if you update your plan according to your context, you get 80 something success rate, 80 something percent success rate. Iron is like, wow, look at that, 2% to about 30%. Okay. And diamond, you can see like 0 to 9%. And this highlights the importance. Let me just iterate this again. All right. Importance of environment feedback to condition the plan. Okay. There's no point planning if you don't get the feedback from the environment because it's like a leader okay, not seeing the reality of the situation but just giving the plans based on what he or she thinks it is. So it, it, it doesn't match with the ground, you see. So this situation aware planning allows you, okay, it's, it's something like that. You have an actor here or let's call it an agent. The agent, okay, will give you an action and the action will go into your environment. And this environment will again give you an observation that will go back to your agent. So if you do a sequence of actions without um, taking into account the observations, what will happen is that you might have an environment mismatch. So there's a lot of um, work about large language models is that they are not exactly in the environment itself. And that is why they may not be the best tool to, to use for like embodied agents if you don't update their plans. Okay, but the moment if you update the plan, you give like the environment feedback, environment observation or like error message to the agent, uh, the agent is able to dynamically adjust the plan. And that's very important. Like, and memory also helps here because the agent is able to take the memory of the history of what happened before to get you a better plan. Like if, for example, you keep walking straight and you, you bump a wall, you know, if you have that memory trace of what you did before that, you will know that, hey, I shouldn't continue going straight because I will keep bumping the wall. I should try something else. Okay, but if you don't have this memory, then you, you may not be able to do it. It's, and this is actually the, the core thing for the React framework. Okay, I'm not sure if you all heard of React, but React is a framework whereby you do something like that. You do um, basically, the, the, you do thoughts. It's like there's a wall. I, 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 I need to go through the door or something. Then you have your observation. The, the door is locked. And then like the then action, find the key to unlock the door. So this is the thoughts observ observation action thing. And uh, that's, that's the React framework. It basically, through the observation of the environment, okay, it, it kind of corrects the plan, which is like the thought itself, and gives you an action that is based on the environment itself. 
So um, through this observation of the environment, the agent is able to succeed in more tasks. And that's why the React framework is so helpful. Like I always like to compare this with the uh, UDA framework, the observe, orient. You know, this is used in the military, like observe, orient, decide, act. So again, in this framework, you observe the situation, you orient yourself in the situation, you decide what to do and then you act on it. So again, this is what is used in militaries, uh, UDA framework, or UDA cycle, very similar to the React framework. Again, you can see the observation and updating your decision based on the environment is very important. Okay, and so you ask something, can you explain what is the difference between online and situation-aware planning? Okay, so... Uh, any planning can be online, you see. So like online means that I plan on the fly. So if I were to do my planning, every time step, one action, maybe I already have a plan before that. That's also online learning. So situation aware planning is basically at every time step, you take into account the feedback from the environment. Yeah. So online planning may not be situation aware. You, you might just be doing it online, but you don't care about the environment observations. Okay. So um, this situation aware um. Planning is not new, by the way. Okay. Um. The as I said earlier, the React framework already does it. Voyager and Ghost in the Minecraft also do it. Uh, Voyager they do it because they feedback the code error message back to the agent, because Voyager is doing code. Ghost in the Minecraft they will feedback, hey, the plan failed because of this part, because the environment will give some error message as well. So both both have this error message thing, and uh, this situation aware planning is just saying that. Hey, you know, um, as compared to what we have done earlier in large language models, we should still continue doing this. Okay, so I, I don't think there's anything new here, but the thing that is interesting is that, you know, if you don't do the planning, because I think th th this is the only study that I see that compare like situation aware versus non-situation aware, you can see the difference, right? <laughs> if you don't do the, the dynamic planning, you, you basically don't solve a lot of things. So... I mean, if you all are interested to create embodied systems or like systems that do things online or do things that is in a very dynamic environment, you must take in the environment feedback. It is a must. Okay, if not, you will have very lousy plans. Okay, I, I hope that's clear. Any questions on this? Okay, let's move on. All right, so this is the cool stuff. This is the overview of the entire system. So they use memory a lot. All right, and I like it a lot. Uh, I, I love memory. Yeah, so so they they use memory a lot. And let's just take a look at this left diagram first. Uh, you will see that over here we have a task. Like for example, the task could be craft a wooden pickaxe. And then what we will do is we'll we'll basically do a plan. All right. So this plan could be like the sub goal planning. Like the plan is something like a sub goal. Like you can plan achieve a certain sub goal like for example um, collect wood all right so after that what you do is you will then go into the controller okay before before that this memory augmented uh, multimodal language model um, there's also this observation here that goes inside so i'll talk about observation here but this observation is rgb pixels and some environment states in, in text So this is more or less it. So based on these two, we'll, we'll do the planning. And then after that, what we'll do next is that we'll use the controller to come up with some rudimentary actions like the keyboard and mouse. And then this will play out in the environment. So now let's zoom in. Okay, let's zoom inside the uh, this part here, the multimodal augmented, multi, sorry, the memory augmented multimodal language model. What exactly is in here? So over here, you can see that given the environment state and the task itself, Okay, which is the vision and language. Okay. We go through our memory. Okay, so you can see this is something like a rack, retrieval or method generation. Given our current state, our current state of the environment, we look through our memories and see what's similar. Okay, over here, um, they use cosine similarity over embedding space. There's two embedding space here. One is text, one is image. How they retrieve, I'll go through in a separate slide but they retrieve relevant memories from this multimodal memory and they use it as context. It actually is the same as REC. Okay, they use it as context and do a plan. Okay, and then what will happen for this plan is they will give a sequence of actions. 
Okay, and the first action will go inside this planner to, to be executed. Okay, so eventually, sorry, um, the, the planner will give the plan and the first action of this plan, okay, the first step of this plan will be given into the controller, okay, through language. So you can prompt the controller saying that collect wood in, in, in plain language and the controller will then do it. So, so this controller is, um, it takes in a goal in free text and outputs actions. All right, uh, how they train it is not in the paper. Okay, but as you can already see from what I talked about earlier, the controller is the is the downfall of this entire method. All right, if you can have a better controller, I think it will outperform goes into Minecraft. All right, so this memory part, I will highlight again, very important. Without this memory, the performance is is crap. Okay, it's not it's not good. So you can see memory here is a very useful thing. Later you will see some results for ablation studies of memory. Okay, another thing to note is because memories are so important, like, you know, if you think about babies, right? Like when they start the world, they don't have memories. They don't know how to walk. They don't know how to eat food. They don't know how to talk. Like, how do we get this basic stuff um, taught to, to babies, right? To, 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 in this case, an agent that has no knowledge of the world. How do we teach the agent, like, how to collect wood? How to hunt ship and so on? Uh, we, we, we don't really... Um, we can't like just download everything into them. I mean that, that that's a bit cheating, right? I mean that will be something like what um Ghost in the Minecraft is doing. They have a structured function already that can do it. So the the agent or the baby comes in the world knowing some stuff. No, that that's one approach to do it. Um, the other approach is what Voyager is doing, and also what this method is doing. So this method is is something like Voyager for this part. You have a task pool, okay? So this task pool is already filled with tasks from the mine from the Minecraft benchmark. So you just select based on this task. Okay, based on this memory is like what tasks have succeeded. Okay, something like the skill library here in this memory. So based on what tasks have been succeeded, I will then ask the large language model to choose. Okay, LM will decide tasks that are manageable that are manageable. So again, we have to rely uh, a bit on the LM knowing like what task can be done. This step is not a fail safe, it, it, it might fail. Um, but the idea is that after you select some task that can, can be done, you, uh, this is a very interesting step, all right? This, this step, I agree a lot. You generate a swarm of agents with um, a random task from the task set and a random start point. Okay, why do we do this? All right, you see, a human society is not uh, intelligent based on only one person, right? We are intelligent actually based on a group of people, like a collective group of individuals, all doing their own different things, and eventually they share knowledge, then everyone improves. So the idea is similar. You cannot just have one agent exploring the world. It will take forever. Like, if it's just you yourself, if you think about it, in human society, if it's just you, just one person, would we have invented the computers? I don't think so. I mean, you need someone who can do electric electrical circuits. You need someone who can do like the coding stuff. You need someone who can do the structure of the computers and so on. Uh, yeah, so all this, like also you need someone to manufacture them. Yeah, that, 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 that is difficult. So if we don't have enough people that do different aspects of the whole chain, it's very hard for one person to, to know everything. So, okay, over here, um, the idea is slightly different. The idea is that uh, in order to make sure that like you can do stuff like collect wood, um, it might take too long for one single agent to discover it on its own. So what could be done is you could have a swarm of agents, a group of them all explore the environment. And you know, if one of them succeeds, then everyone succeeds. Yeah, so, <laughs> so it's actually a way to um, improve the success rate and also collect experiences. Uh, because you can see in the memory that they collect here, only successful tasks. Are collected okay uh this is something i disagree with all right because in this case you can only collect experiences that that work out what about those that don't work out all right so i think there's a lot of wasted experiences here but the idea of this uh distribution of generating a multiple agents to explore an environment and you know use the best one to update the rest i think this idea is good so this idea will likely um, be useful for artificial super intelligence where as a group, all the agents will, will learn stuff and we keep updating 
um like some agents with the best knowledge so that as a as a group there'll be collective improvement okay why i say some agents is because if we update all agents together in in the best improvements there's no diversity anymore so there, there needs to be some diversity uh in a system uh, that can achieve artificial super intelligence for diverse environments because if the moment the environment change you want some agents that can adapt okay um so over here uh, they're not interested in environment change so they don't do it okay because why why are they not interested in environment change the minecraft environment envir environment doesn't change <laughs> it's always the same environment so um, over here all the agents are the same they all get updated the same memory and so on yeah but what i'm talking about is uh more of like future plans okay we are not going to create agents just for minecraft that's too small all right we're going to do it for the real world so this needs to improve a bit and whatever i just said diverse memories diverse agents update some agents i think this processes we need to investigate more because um i believe using memory to improve agents is great but more importantly we need a diverse set of agents so that we can counter different changes in environments Okay, I talked quite a bit over here. So in summary, um, use memories to create better plans on the left and on the right, use a group of agents, okay, and a LM to select tasks that are manageable for the agents to build up this memory. Questions on this slide? Because I think this is more or less uh, the summary slide for Jarvis one. Or any, anything you want to um, talk about? Uh, maybe you can- John, I, I just want to add and um you know what you said about it's not just success but also uh obstacles that other agents face and i i also believe just like you obstacles that agents you know were able to overcome or not able to overcome can shed a lot of light into the collective wisdom and intelligence so i don't know if you have you know anything to add in that area yeah, definitely. I believe we should collect all kinds of experience, success or failure. I mean, you can definitely learn from failure. You learn what not to do, right? Or, or you basically learn how to get to somewhere else. Like there's this thing in um, reinforcement learning. It's called hindsight experience replay. Let me just type, write it down here. So basically, it's saying that um, if you fail to achieve your, your initial goal, like let's say I want to make my hand touch this other path. If I fail to reach there, I reach here instead. What did I learn? I learned how to get here. Right, so so you cannot discount that you have learned something. Instead of reaching here, you actually reach here. Okay, in, in my learning fast and slow, I, I actually learned to reach any single point in the trajectory. So I, I learned even more efficiently than hindsight experience replay. Uh, but over here, you see, because they only store the success, uh, successful tasks, just like Voyager, they lose out on like how to do certain other things. Like if I can get the forest A in the other experience, maybe forest A can be a bootstrapping point for another task. Yeah, so so that that is missing out here we are only heavily focused on task success which i don't think is uh is, is the best way to learn yeah so i i definitely agree with you here yeah okay um any other points if not i'll move on okay let's uh move on then okay so what is the observational space of Jarvis one. So as I already said earlier, you have this RGB frame, which is a great improvement, by the way. I mean, it's not easy to process this. They they use mind clip to you know to convert this into a, a suitable embedding space. Uh, mind clip is trained using uh, lots of <laughs> image samples, but you know, granted, we just give it to them. Um, this is not easy to to do. All right, we haven't solved images yet. Okay. Um, next, we have the position of the player, the location. I mean, you can read the rest yourself. The The rest are in text. Okay, and basically, they just tell you some information about the game. And I think this is one thing I would like to highlight is this is quite realistic. Because it's the same information the player gets. There's no um, there's nothing here that the player cannot cannot see. Okay, it's just that the player may not be looking at like the XYZ coordinates. Like usually, sometimes, you know, you 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 don't really look at this. Although you could have it, but you don't really need to use your and everything. Like humans, we navigate by basically like roughly mapping everything in the in the world in some position in our heads. <laughs> we don't really see this input sometimes. But but you know, I I can still think that this is this can be realistic. I mean, in a in a true embodied agent, you can put a GPS there. I think it's fine. Yeah. So, I I think this is great. So. 
very very close to embodied agents now with 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 this paper. So how do they process the images? Okay, so this is the part, all right, that um basically they convert to text. <laughs> so um what they realize is that a direct end to end conversion from image to text is not good. Okay, because the LM can tend to hallucinate a lot of things. So they actually did this pipeline thing. First, rather than captioning the scene directly, they extract keywords, okay, using the Minecraft wiki. And basically use these keywords to describe the scene. So it's like, is the Akasha, Akasha tree there? Is the ship there? Okay, so I they didn't really describe how they did this. But I suppose what they did is they basically asked whether certain key, keywords are in the image. So if let's say um, you know that Akasha, ship, Akasha tree and ship are in the image, you can then use GPT to construct the sentence, I can see ship in the Akasha planes. Okay, so this is what I call a uh, like entity extraction, then followed by sentence composition. So they, they do this because if you ask LMs to directly do the sentence composition, it, it is horrible. All right, so I can understand this. I mean, if you use uh, image question answer stuff like clip, uh, like sorry, like blip, all right, you ask your image questions. I mean, now the recent one is Lava, Lava 1.5, yeah, or GPT, GPT V, GPT 4 V. You ask your image certain questions. You know, sometimes if you ask too complicated stuff, you get nonsense responses, right? What may be better is you ask targeted questions, ask simple questions, and then after that, you, you do the process to stitch them back together. So um, this is exactly what they do. Um, they also say that they use uh, like situation details like biome, inventory status into text using templates. Okay, but what templates? Okay, what templates are there? It's not in the paper. All right, so, uh, but the idea is they constrain how the output of the large language model would be using these templates. And I think this is awesome. All right. So I always believe in this, um, that constraint generation is the best. <laughs> because if you let LMs free flow generate, you will get lots of hallucinations. So this is how they did it. They constrained the generation into text. Great. So this is how they interpret the image. They interpret everything as, as text. Okay. And basically use the um, um, the multimodal language model, okay, um, convert it into a plan. So, so this is basically the GPT-4 part, okay, given the task instruction and all the, all the input. So the input as in the text input, image converted to text input and text input. So, so you use this to condition, to condition plan generation. So again, uh, you can see that this is not exactly image, um, Full, full image processing. It's not like image straight away to plan. You go image to text then to plan. So um, the question is, will we lose information? So maybe you want to think about it. If we use a text to describe the image, will we lose out stuff? Yeah, I mean, the answer is yes. <laughs> okay, so you will, you will lose out certain things. I mean, you will lose out maybe the position of the, the ship, position of the tree and so on. You can say, I can see ship in the plane, but where is the ship? Yeah. So, uh, okay, when you ask, how do they deal with 3D? Uh, the, the image processing part can can process 3D stuff, right? Because they use a wide variety of, of uh, images from the Minecraft environment. Yeah, so they can see like, oh, this is a ship, this is 3D. I mean, same like um, how do you do ImageNet. ImageNet is a 3D kind of, Go right. Our world is three D, but once you take into two D picture, you know your car at various orientations. As long as you have enough samples at each orientation, you can tell it's a car regardless of orientation. So um, I think this is the same thing that is used here. Okay, but what I'm saying is that if we convert the image into text, we might lose out certain things. Uh, because there's different ways of processing images. You can process image at the skin level. You can project process image at the object level. You can process image at the pixel level. Like sometimes you're interested in different things in the image. Like you're interested to see whether my inventory has certain items and so on. But what they do is they bypass this by using text inputs. Because like most important inputs in the game are from text. All right. The scene part, what you really need to know is like where, where's my enemy in relation to me and so on. Um, I think this part here uh, might be 
a little lacking, okay, if, if we do this conversion into text, okay, unless, you know, um, they hard code it in. So because they don't have any details about this in the paper, I cannot comment much on this, but I'm, I'm sure there's some hard coding here. Yeah, because just, I can see ship in the Acacia planes. Uh, it's not it's not going to be enough to, to do the plan to get to the ship, right? You need to know where the ship is, like which, which location and so on. So uh, I, I do think this part could be improved. Okay. Um, we could ask not just only like the macro questions, we could also ask the micro questions, like where is the ship? Where is the tree, you know? Um, stuff like this could actually give us a better resolution of uh, how to form our plans. Okay, so I quite like them um, using image directly, but the way we process the image could be better. Uh, could have different scales of abstractions. All right. Okay, uh, any questions so far? All right, let's move on to the next one. Uh, so this is uh, sub-goal planning, all right? Very similar to goals in the Minecraft where you split your main task into sub-goals. And uh, the sub-goals, okay, so the thing is, let's take, for example, enchanting table. To get enchanting table, you need the book, the diamond, and the obsidian. Okay, the question is, how do we know, right? Which sub-goals are useful? Okay, the, the question, the, the thing is, we we don't okay we 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 don't know like like the agent doesn't know if you haven't crafted your enchanting table before there's no way you would know that you need these three items unless the game tells you somewhere okay and uh, the main thing in minecraft is that i i personally haven't played played minecraft but i believe for minecraft this this uh, way of crafting maybe is is in the wiki already and players look at the wiki to play it. but if you were to like anyhow take the items and craft together. Maybe people have found out and then they add to the wiki. I don't know how, how anyone have played Minecraft. How how do people know the new item recipes? Is it is it stated in the game or anything? If anyone played Minecraft before, you can uh, you can chime in. If not, what I'm going to say is that um, the item recipes, they may be found through try and error. Or maybe the game will give you or uh, through the wiki. So, this is uh not very clear how you do it, right? But right now, in order to split into sub goals, I'm very sure in this part here, you consult the wiki. I I believe that they consult the wiki as well as the tons of millions of YouTube videos that explain step by step how you would get to a certain goal. And I think that they have a way to um, uh, encode the YouTube videos and feed it back into here as instructions, like a manual. Mm, uh, over here, the, the reasoning process doesn't use YouTube videos. So um, in this case, I believe it's just the Minecraft Wiki uh, for this Jarvis one paper. Maybe for other papers, they use the videos. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So... Uh, as you can see, this uh, sub goal thing is not very realistic. Okay, how many times in real life your sub goal is so obvious? Like, if I let's say I want to retire in ten years, like, how is my sub goal gonna be like earn a million a year? You know, kind of thing. how how are you gonna quantify this? So so in the Minecraft game is easy, because like if they are talking about enchanting table, it's a fixed uh, number of items and so on that you can get there. Okay, so in this case, yeah, you can use the sub, the Minecraft wiki. So I wouldn't say this is very impressive. You can actually just use rule base to, to just split it up. No problem. You can even split it up all the way until the sub goal. Over here, um, they they have a limit to when the reasoning stops. And then like, basically what happens is that you look at what part is in memory. Okay, Because in memory, you have the plan stored here. So for example, if you have obsidian to diamond pickaxe, if it's, if it's in there, you can actually refer to the plan over here. Okay, you can basically put this in, in your context and, and get it. Okay, what is what is more important, okay, is like actually this part here, not in memory. Then, you know, how how do you do this? This one, you need to um, basically do it on your own. Okay, so over here, what will happen is we will try to get the sub goals that are present in memory. So you see all this tick over here? Diamond is present in memory. So I... In my query to retrieve the memory, I try to retrieve the diamond. So I, I, I like this part a lot because 
this means that if you have succeeded in certain tasks before, you know, why reinvent the wheel, right? Why why try to do it? Um, like why why try to find out this sequence of unknown steps here when you already have found it, right? What you can do is you can just stick from memory, like ladder. I I've 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 created ladder before. Let's let's try to retrieve this part from memory. I've done paper before, so let's retrieve this from memory. And then finally, I've done like iron pickaxe before, so I can retrieve this from memory. So what they do is they append the initial um query, okay, to the memory with whatever sub goals that have been done before. So like diamond, leather, paper, pickaxe, okay, and we will try to refer to this multimodal memory, which stores like the task of like what has been created. And so if there's a match in the task, okay, like for example, if I am pickaxe, you have an I am pickaxe in memory, you can directly retrieve out the chunk that tells you I am pickaxe. So actually this, this thing is also very similar to, to Voyager, extracting out put functions that are useful for tasks, okay? So in this case, we refer to memory and in memory is like all the stuff that has succeeded before. We basically take in the successful plan and condition it in like a rack fashion, in a retrieval augmented generation fashion so that we can use that existing successful plan to create our final plan. So you can see, um, one thing I don't like is that like in goals in the Minecraft, um, what happens is that they will execute each sub goal one at a time. Here they try to do the whole plan at one go, the entire giant plan at one go, you know, and and that's not a great idea because you know, um, it is better to execute things in parts. It makes makes life easier for the agent than to create the entire whole plan by itself. You know, that's that's a huge plan, and from what I understand from the paper, they just take the entire query and concatenate with all this, right? This might cause some issues in cosine similarity matching. Because you can have diamond, leather, paper, iron, pickaxe. You know, if you have too many, if you have too many items here, too many um goals here, too many sub goals, you might miss out the cosine similarity to to each sub goal. Because like if you encode all the sub goals together in one chunk, your embedding might be different from encoding them separately. So I not sure how they do this here, but I would recommend like encoding each sub goal one at a time, like iron pickaxe you encode into some vector embedding. And then you compare with your memories, like maybe iron pickaxe, you encode this. Let me use a different color. You encode the iron pickaxe into a vector embedding. And then you encode this task entity like stone pickaxe to another embedding. I will recommend doing this. And then like you do cosine similarity to to check whether it's similar. So this is what I will have done. I'll do cosine similarity per sub goal. Okay. To find out similar sub goals in memory. Okay. So this is what they do. They do the query of the text to the multimodal memories task. And then there's also another check, okay, which I'll go through in the next slide, but I'll just cover here for completeness. They will take the image embedding model, which is the mind clip. They map, they map it to a vector as well. And they compare with this image here to do a further um to, to, to do a further test. So why is this done? So the first the first check is to see task relevance. And the second check is to see biome relevance. Because like if the task is completed in the forest. You will, you will take a plan from the forest. If the task is completed in the cave or what, you will take the, the thing from the cave. And this image similarity would tell you which biome it is. Right. So this is at, at least what I think they are trying to do. And uh yeah, it, it works pretty well. I don't quite agree with the second check, but it works pretty well for Minecraft right now. So if you can't think of it, actually, maybe the image is not needed, right? What you could really do is you could just encode your biome into your state. Yeah. So I think there's a little bit of lacking. Something's lacking in the way they store the image here. Like, why do you only store the end state? Okay. So two things I don't like here. One is when they retrieve the 
memory, they kind of seem to retrieve every single thing concatenated together in one embedding. All the sub goes together. I, I don't think this is a great idea. Second thing, the image that they store in memory is only the image of the final frame, like the 360 degree view around the agent once the task is completed. They don't store any other image in the trajectory. And I think that that's missing out some stuff as well. Okay, uh, Sumet, you asked something. What is our sub goals from a predetermined set in this framework? Uh, you mean whether or not, like from, like for example, enchanting table to obsidian, diamond, and book, is it a fixed process? Uh, is, is it already common knowledge? Is, is that what you're asking? Yeah, once you break down the bigger thing into subtasks, is it from a fixed dictionary of subtasks? Is that important? Or can there be, can the subtasks be random English questions? Okay, I think it's fixed. I, I'm quite sure they use the, the Minecraft wiki for this. So like given the enchanting table, I 100% know that it's Obsidian Diamond Book, without a doubt. Yeah, that is also why I think that this sub goal decomposition works well in Minecraft because everything seems to be sequentially done, but I don't think it will work well in the real world. Yeah, unless you also have a wiki for the real world, you know, like to craft a table, you need four legs and one blank. Yeah. But yeah, this is one of the limitations of this work is that um, it seems quite clear cut, a bit too clear cut for real world use case. All right. So um, this is what I was talking about earlier. Um, how do they store the memory? They store basically the goal that is achieved, like what has been crafted. They store the plan, okay? And this plan is actually the most important because they use this plan to later condition the generation of the, the, the more complicated tasks. So in some sense, you take what has been solved and then you use what has been solved to generate something even tougher because Minecraft is a progression based thing. So it, like if you store whatever you have done, like this is, okay, let's think of it like that. This is your soft bubble. But in Minecraft, <laughs> the unsolved bubble, okay, kind of uses what has been solved. So it's like, this is the unsolved bubble. But you kind of need to reference what has been solved here in order to, to, to do the unsolved. So this, this idea of using memory of, of earlier tasks to condition the later few tasks, I think that's great for Minecraft. I think that's great for Minecraft. But, um, but in real world, your unsolved tasks might not be the same, might not be bootstrap of soft. Yeah, you, you may not be able to do this. So what, what you really need in the real world is you need a way to need a way to mix and match earlier soft tasks, like parts of it. Like for example, if you know how to read a book, maybe you read um Harry Potter books, and that's the only book you read in your memory. But sometimes maybe your new task requires you to read Lord of the Rings, right? But if you don't read, if you don't store parts of your tasks in your memory, like it, maybe you won't be able to like get the reading part done. I mean, over here, you may be able to do it because like if your subtask here is con like this part might be reading, you might be able to take this out for your new task. So maybe it will work. Yeah. But I still have some issue about storing like, like the, the successful goals here in memory because I personally don't think memory should just be about successes. Yeah. I, I mean, like, and also how do you define successes in the real world, right? Like, what does it mean? Like, in Minecraft, yes, I craft a certain item that there's like a checkpoint. What's my checkpoint in real life? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what's the checkpoint like. Yeah, so so I, I don't think this is the right way to store memory, uh, but it works in Minecraft because Minecraft is a very linear kind of progression kind of thing. Okay, so let's just talk about how they store it in, 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 in their memory, and then I will, I will talk about my tech at the bottom. Next, we have the state, okay, which is the 360 degree view when the agent has completed the task. You can see over here. All right. So great, this is how they store multimodal memory. They store the item and the plan. Okay. Um my my grab is that you know actually your image is your image may not be useful. Because like you're just take, taking only the last part. I mean you you may as well just store the bio. Yeah. So I don't know whether this is uh indeed the, the case, but 
um, I do think that the image here is a bit like kind of a by the way kind of thing. Like it's not really used properly and I can understand why uh, we haven't solved images yet. So it's a bit hard to use images in other ways. Uh, but, but this way is a bit, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a bit lacking. Yeah, I, I do feel it's a bit lacking, right, for this. Okay. So uh, my take on the memory is like, you know, why just store the success, right? Why not make any point along the trajectory a goal? Then you can learn to reach any point. And also, why not make any point a start point? Okay. So like, you see, different environmental states are not stored. You miss out on all this as well. So what I was thinking is, instead of just storing, like, the final goal and the plan, why not just store like transitions? So you could go like from you, you can store from state one to state two. You can store the plan to get there, and then you can store like the image trajectory. So whenever you want to, so it's something like my learning fast and slow. So if let's say you want to go from state one to state three, then you can retrieve transitions from state one to state two and then state two to state three so with this uh, mix and match transitions thing you are able to utilize any kind of experience that you have done before and you are able to learn from success or failure there's no such thing as success or failure here it's just transitions and if you can find a way to map your transitions from your start state all the way to your end state which is like from nothing to wooden pickaxe or nothing to diamond pickaxe you can just keep retrieving your transitions and you know you get your actions and the benefit of doing this transition based approach is that you can potentially train your model all right to like learn better trajectory so so maybe what they do over here is uh, we cannot discount this so eventually your trans eventually transitions might be consolidated via reflection to form trajectory paths like this. Yeah. So so I, I don't discount this could be an end state at the end, but I don't think this should be the start state. So uh, yeah, this is just my take on it. I think the memory is very limited here. We could do better, right? So you just wait for my further research on this. So maybe maybe I would be able to, to get a better uh, a better way to, to do this memory. Yeah, I, I believe we should store transitions rather than um, store the entire plan. But maybe memory exists in, in both in both ways. Just that over here they just focus on the plan part. Okay, uh maybe I open to the floor. A any other text on this? Okay, if not, let's move on. So how do we retrieve the memory? As why I mentioned earlier, we take the text embeddings between the text query and the task, okay, to get memories above a certain similarity score. Then we use the image, the mind clip embeddings between the query image and the state image, which is this, this one here. So there are two steps. One is filtered by task relevance, and then next filtered by environment relevance using the image. And then eventually we will take the, the plan. How do we generate the memories? As what I mentioned earlier, um, they have a fixed set of tasks here, and then they explore, as a distributed set of agents to explore this. And all these agents means that if any of them solve the tasks, okay, they will learn the plan from each other. Okay, this is very similar to like goals in the Minecraft. Like um, they also have this multiple exploration part to learn the sub goals and so on. Uh, actually, this I realize, uh, although the memory is different from Voyager learning the code for each task, but you know, it's same as Voyager, in that it stores only successful tasks. Yeah. So this is the idea of uh, generating more and more like skills that you can leverage on, like the earlier memories. And yeah, you can keep updating these skills or memories in order to perform more and more difficult tasks. Yeah, so this works for Minecraft. But if the environment changes a bit, you know, maybe we want more varied memory. Um, is there improvement of memory? You should update your, let's say your plan takes 10 steps to get a wooden pickaxe when there's another plan that only takes five. Should we override the memory better ones? The thing is, they don't have to override here because the sub goal decomposition is perfect. Right? Why? Because you use everything based on the, the Minecraft wiki, right? So, uh, I mean, it's, it's quite obvious how you can get, like, from to Diamond Pickaxe, it's a fixed set of steps, and the fixed set of steps are the 
optimal already because you are basing off the wiki. So in the real world, this is not going to happen. We will need to override memories with better ones, more relevant to the task. Like if let's say um, a, a path is shorter than another path, maybe you want to override in order to get to this goal, like you override that path. Yeah. So I think all oh, this is not done. Okay. And it's because of the limitations of the Minecraft environment. It's not realistic enough. All right. Yeah, so uh, one one question here. I I was really thinking about this uh, when I was reading the paper, right? So you're really right that Minecraft is different. So in real life, say, say for example, you have a son who is like, you know, four years old, love to kick the, the, the football, right? Or soccer, right? In this case. And then, so so two options, you can let your son to play around with the with the ball and just you know leave him alone or the second option is that you will go to hire a coach and try to coach your son and hopefully you will coach him to be a soccer star right so which mm -hmm. one is the best option you don't know that until he's like you know 35 years old because yeah. Yeah. there are parents who who's who drill their sons to learn soccer or golf they end up like you know having a miserable life right so the point I think is that we should keep both, right? And and watch for the consequences and, and keep all of the options into memory and tracking the trajectory or the path of all the subsequent um encounters with the environment in order to give a not a final but you know sequential assessment instead. Yep, back to you. Yeah, so that's a valid point. So storing transitions is better than storing the entire trajectory here. Uh, I also think the uh, part about like you don't know for sure what is right at the beginning, that needs to be factored in as well. Uh, right now we have absolute certainty of the plan, like over here. This part here, um, once we have uncertainty, maybe we can do some form of reflection and overriding memories. So now uh, this point on memory storage, multiple abstraction spaces to store memory and how we reflect upon the memory. I'm very interested in it. And I think this is going to get us to very intelligent agents. Okay. What you see here is just like less than 10% of what could be done. Uh, um, honestly, the the memory here is so limited. Yeah, I, I think we can do way better than this. Okay. So if no one else is, is going to do this, then I will do it. Yeah. So so my, my next research will be something related to this. <laughs> yeah. So um, one good thing about Jarvis 1 is that it manages to do some form of diversity. So you can get diversity based on various biomes. You can do wooden pickaxe and it works at all areas. And why? Why does it work? Because multiple agents are trained. Uh, uh, you explore multiple biomes. So uh, it, it is no surprise that it works. Okay, Because your training set includes all biomes. So um, this is what we call um, domain randomization in, in reinforcement learning. We basically train the agent across multiple environments. Does it generalize from one environment to another? Probably not, All right? Probably not in this case. Uh, Minecraft can be quite different in terms of how you craft different things at different areas. Okay, you can have the same steps, but you, you need to find the stuff. So uh, I would say that um, at least they got one part right here is, is the way that we do some form of like learning across different environments. Maybe if, maybe there's some transfer learning. I think transfer learning is still possible. And how do they do the transfer learning? By memories. So if one agent has succeeded at a task at one environment, the next batch of agents will have access to that memory and they could perhaps integrate some parts of the plan into the new environment. So I do think this is crucial. Um, basically training in multiple environments and using memories so that you can do some form of a LM based context a context based learning to generate similar plans in different environments. Yeah, so this is something that is really cool. I think this is something they got right here. Yep. So okay, when you mentioned something, hope our memory design will work for Minecraft as well as for elementary school kids for better life learning but school teachers can learn from simulated examples as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So uh, yeah, I think this is in line to what I was saying. So you, you need to generate memory 
based on the environment. So, so there's no way you can generate memory without experiencing. So increase your exposure, increase your experiences. Actually, this applies for us as well. Like in order to do like problem solving or what, increase your amount of experiences so you get different views about different things. Like I'm reading lots of different subjects as well, biology, neuroscience, psychology, and so on. Increase your exposure to different ideas. Then you can use that memories to try to piece something out together. I mean, that, that's essentially what I've been doing the last few years. Okay. And the other thing is you need to like learn. Okay, over here, they are multiple agents. <laughs> they learn from other people, I guess, like in, in our case, like learn from other people that, that you think are relevant. Yeah, you, can, you, can, you can learn that. And with this in mind, increasing experiences and learning from other people, you can build a, quite a diverse set of memories, which can be useful for whatever goal you're doing. Ah, all right. So this is a new thing in Jarvis What It's called reflection and error. Uh, it's called self-check. So what is self-check? This is something new. So um, in like Voyager and those in the Minecraft, what happens is they have a plan. And then if let's say the plan fails, then they go through the environment feedback, this part here, to the planner again to redo the plan. Okay. So like this self-explain is like the reflection. Okay, it's like why did the plan fail and how to update it? Okay, this self check is new. Okay, what is self check? Self check means that self check is reflecting before the plan is executed. So, uh, while okay, while I say it's similar to reflection, reflection is reflecting after the plan has been executed. What is what is self check? Self check is saying that okay, I created a plan. Okay, I created one plan, and you know before I execute it in the environment, which can be quite lengthy to execute. You know, this is my plan I created. I basically do a simulation. I say okay, from this to this, what materials do I need? What materials do I have left? This one to this one, what materials do I need? So basically, they play out the entire plan, including the materials before and after each step. So this is a rule-based thing. Okay, If something happens that takes in more materials than you have, you will flag an error and say, hey, there's not enough wood. What kind of nonsense plan is this? Okay, so so how, how, how would you view this in real life? It's like this. Um, let's say you have a CEO in the company. All right, The CEO says, hey, let's build GPT-5 and then like the, the person in the company might say like the CTO might say hey we don't have enough compute yeah so so it's like someone will, will say like you know this is the, the self-check it's like you, you have like someone else look through the plan make sure every step is okay yeah so this is the idea and uh, how do they know what materials are needed right Never said, but um, I'm very sure it's also based on the Minecraft wiki. So, yeah, so Minecraft is it is is difficult, but you know, like this kind of steps, most agents are just using Minecraft wiki. It's kind of cheating, like because you already know for sure what's gonna happen. I mean, if if you use it from memory, I can still understand, but if you say from the Minecraft wiki, that's like a ground truth. All right, so, uh, but still, this self check is a is a novel idea. I guess we can also do this for other domains as well, like. If you have certain um things that you want to do, like uh you're doing entity extraction from large language models, maybe you could do a rule based check to make sure that you know the first cut is all right. Or if you are doing other things like uh doing sentiment analysis, you know you do a again a rule based check, make sure the output is with positive, negative, or neutral. You know, this is like a sort of check. And if let's say your LM doesn't give you that kind of stuff that you you know based on the rules. Okay, so let me just, it's a, it's a rule-based check to make sure things are okay. All right, so, so if let's say something is wrong, you can feedback an error even before executing it. So this is useful for stuff whereby the execution is very costly and lengthy, like for Minecraft. You do the plan wrongly, you know, you're going to take a lot of compute and a lot of time. So if you could stop yourself there, you could say, hey, something's wrong with the plan, update it. Ah, then you will save a lot of effort. So this is self-check. Uh, any questions on self-check? I think this is quite a nice idea, actually. All right. 
So this is this is something that I agree with. The so self check is good. All right. So what's the performance? Okay. Um. Don't have to say too much. They perform pretty well. Two hundred tasks. They did um all the tasks. Okay. But they don't have like the high as high success rate as like goes in the Minecraft. Like you can see the diamond task, they did about 8.99. Um, goes in the Minecraft got about 50%, diamond pickaxe. Yeah, so you know, but it's much better than the native GPT and the React framework. Very, very good already. All right. So uh, the rest, inner monologue and depth, don't need to compare, they they do quite poorly, all right. But just based on LM based methods, you know, uh the basic methods they do way better. Um they uh I think comparable to Voyager because Voyager didn't do this success rate chart, so I cannot compare. But for Ghost in the Minecraft, Ghost in Minecraft does better. And that is because of the controller, which I'm going to talk about now. Oh, sorry. Uh, controller is the left. So, so now I'm going to talk about memory. All right. So you can see the memory part is very important for the success. So if you look over here, if we don't use memory, we get about 85%. I think this wooden pickaxe and stone pickaxe onwards, you get close to 0% here. Okay, if we only use the text-based memory, okay, all right, and uh, this you can see that you can get some success, but you won't get very good. If you do reasoning, again, okay, the reasoning process I believe is the um sub goal decomposition, right? You can get the reasoning step is very very important. Okay, you can get quite high success rates, and then finally, if you use the multimodal memory, you can see that the 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 success rate has improved like about ten percent. So I would say that the multimodal memory, the image memory, gives some context of the biome. At least this is my understanding of it. Yeah, because they only use the final image frame. It's, it's not going to give you much context of the entire process. Right, but it shows that using memory is important. I mean, like from the find the diamond task, okay, from 0% without memory to 9% using multimodal memory, that's a huge difference. Right, then the diamond task is not easy, by the way. Yeah, people have tried for years to try to get diamonds. All right, but now that we have solved it, we keep solving it. Actually, you can think about it like LM research, right? Or Minecraft research. Builds on memory, right? We build on people's methods that work. So, like, once we can find diamonds, we can always find diamonds. I mean, if you think about it this way, right? So, so this is this is also a proof of concept. Okay, not not in this paper, but through a series of paper doing Minecraft, you can see that our memory of how to do it, okay, based on what people have done, we keep building on earlier memories, and you know, increases our success rate. So again, this shows memory is important. Uh, if you look at the different items here, you can see that over time, as the memory grows, your success rate of crafting different items increase, but Take a look at this thing here. All right, take a look at this. I think this is the wooden pickaxe. You all notice something weird about this chart? Anyone can tell me what's weird about this? Or what's different about this, this diagram for this wooden pickaxe? Anyone? You see, <laughs> after a size of 100, they actually got 100% success rate for like the wooden pickaxe. But the success rate dip after you have too much memory, you see? Now become ninety five percent. So what does this mean? Too much memory may be bad, All right? You you need to have like if you do retrieval augmented generation, you realize that the more documents you have, the harder it is to retrieve. So same thing because this wooden pickaxe is the base level. Like you have a lot of memories on wooden pickaxe, and sometimes you might have contamination if you have too much memories on that. So maybe. Okay, what needs to be done is better filtering. Like you need to filter more to your tasks and so on. But this kind of shows that um memory is not without its pitfalls. If you have a lot of memory that you store, you better make sure your filtering process is good. If not, you have difficulties. You you will basically have contamination of memories. Next, ah, the controller part. This is what I wanted to say. The controller takes in like a language goal and the observation and come out with actions. Um, the thing is, it's inability to execute short execute, short horizon text instructions is the weakest point, all right? And uh, how is it trained? We don't know. It's not in the paper, okay? But 
I would say that if we could improve the controller better, maybe you use a hard coded controller, like I'm sure you will get much better results for Minecraft. Okay, I'm more or less come to the end for uh, today's Jarvis One discussion. I think um, it's 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 a good paper. It's a uh, it's the, one of the first to use image modality into memory, and I also believe it highlights the usefulness of doing planning using some subcode decomposition, and also using memory to condition your future plans. All these are very important. So uh, we do have about five minutes left. I'm going to go through some discussion questions, and uh, feel free to. Type in the chat or voice out if you have anything to add. If not, I'll be starting on the questions now. So first thing, we only use memory for this paper. Like if you want to do like in the fast and slow method that I propose, you have a memory part, but you also have a neural network part that is learning based on the experiences. If we want to fine tune this neural network part, how can we do it? All right, so actually the question, the answer is simple. You just need to do self-supervised learning from start state to end state and output and action. So right now, um, LMs can do that. You can do instruction fine tuning. And then the, the instruction is the start state to end state. And then the 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 output is the plan. Yeah. So so we can we can do this. Uh, not not a problem. So I'm not sure whether we can do this for the image part. But at least for the text part, we can do this fine tuning if you wanted to, to improve GPT 4s performance or any LM's performance on the Minecraft tasks. So I think this is, is already possible. It's just expensive. All right, next, more crucial thing. There's still a ground truth list of tasks to choose from. All right. So the, the thing is, how can we learn if we do not have any examples of successful tasks? Yeah, I think this one is arbitrary for the Minecraft environment because we evaluate by task. So essentially, it's like we are evaluating the agent on our training set <laughs> because of the self because of the because of the ground truth because of the set of tasks. Task pool contains the the test, um, the, the test set. So how how do we do this? I mean, one way is we need to store transitions and learn from transitions to any end state rather than just successes. So I think this is why it's lacking in this paper. There's a huge thing that's lacking, this transition part. We just need to store the transitions. We don't need to store the entire state of action, set of actions all the way to the goal because that may not be, we, we may not have clear defined goals in real life, but we do learn from any experience we have in real life. We, we need to put that in here. All right, next. The image processing is done by converting the text then passing it through the LM. Okay, are there better ways to process it in the image domain? Uh, yeah, I think multimodal LMs can process image directly. Okay, but we lose out on explainability. Okay, so I think it's a trade-off. Uh, we could also ask process images at various scales, like seen object, pixel, you know, and get various abstraction spaces. Yeah, I, I think that's possible. So we, we may not need to process everything in just the, like, the image tokens and, and, you know, um lose out on text. We can convert everything to text, but we need to do that at multi-scales. And I think that is lacking in this paper. Hey, John. Yeah. Um... Yep. Yep. Uh, quick question here. Um, so when I was reading this paper, I was also relating to um, NVIDIA. So NVIDIA has this concept of using a standard format um, for image, uh, as well as like you know, 3D and movie scenes is called the uh, USD, uh, Universal Scene Description. Mm. So they so they have this concept, you know, where you can actually search and, and say, say, for example, if you want to search a rusty bucket, it can actually pull out a 3D rusty bucket for you. Um, I I don't know if there's somehow there are ways that we can leverage that whole framework of the you know 3D expression because eventually it's not just the image, right? Say, say for example, if you have the office and you have you know two agents working, and when the scene changes, right? Um, and and they're famous for like how the sun rotates. 
the the sun's shade on on the ground. And when that changes, it's the whole scene changes, right? And I don't think I'm not sure if the converting image to text is scalable at that point. Mm. Yeah, back to you. Yeah, that that's true. If you want to be interested in all the macro skills or all the micro skills of that image, then maybe you need to preserve the image directly. Yeah, um, but I'm talking about more like in 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 a practical decision making use case. Usually, we don't need to preserve all information of the image, but you need to remember. Oh, actually, what you make is a good point. What if we store image directly in memory and run inference on image? Based on query, yeah. So, so you don't have to store that's, everything. That's exactly what I was yeah. thinking. Yep. Yeah, yep. yeah. So this is actually in line with memory soup. Is it memory soup? We also store things like directly, and then we only query it at at runtime. Yeah, because if you do it the multiple scales, maybe you miss out stuff. Yeah, that that's a possibility. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, good good ideas there. Good ideas there. So we can ask like the question answer only at runtime based on the query we want. So yeah, and also uh. Also, NVIDIA has its own engine, right? Um, it, it has its own inference engine as well that we can leverage. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. 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 I think all this we are like deviating away from human memory here, but it's fine because actually human memory is quite bad. <laughs> yeah, but but if we can do this in artificial systems, it will surpass humans, most likely. Yeah, so... yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, even they have some research in in uh in the atmosphere research of how the cloud you know move around in in the atmosphere which is like you know billions and billions of parameters yeah very interesting Maybe yeah you can and the paper. yeah I, i'm quite interested to read their papers the nvidia yeah, papers so, <laughs> right yeah. so i'm i'm so i'm i'm thinking that you know the memory that you know we we're, we're thinking here has to be able to generalize in education as well as in, in scientific research, right? Yeah. Sounds 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 good. Sounds good. I, I, I like this idea a lot. Like um basically runtime inference and like how to get more from the memory. Yeah, because I, I do think memory is a huge part of learning. Yeah. So you're absolutely right there. Okay, anyone else before I move to the last slide? Okay, I need another five more minutes. So um Sorry for exceeding a little for the time. Yeah. All right. So the last one, this is uh something that I'll be also talking about in uh in the machine learning street talk uh, book club session two days later. Yeah. So this is uh talking about how much experience should we share. All right. So you know, each knowledge, uh, knowledge for each agent usually is stored in the agent unless you share it with others. In this Jarvis, they share it through all the agents because all the agents are doing similar tasks. Like in real life, you may not want to do that because different people have different capabilities, different um, um, interests and so on. If you share memories with everyone, everyone's going to be the same agent. Like, you know, sh sharing memory, over sh sharing all memory leads to lack of diversity. And this is something that we don't really want in a real world environment because the environment can change. Um, in Minecraft, it's fine because Minecraft environment doesn't change. So, you know, you can have everyone behaving the same way and, and going more and more optimal. I think it's fine. Yeah, but in real world, you know, we might want to think about having diversity between agents by not sharing all your memory. You, you might only share to a select few so that you have different agents with different memories and different contexts. They act differently and, you know, can adapt better collectively to the environment because some will survive better or some will survive less. Yeah, so I don't think we should share experience with everyone. That's my honest point of view. Yeah. So yeah, I think this is an interesting thing. We can we can talk more about this uh, uh offline. Uh, but if you have any quick thoughts, or uh, you have any quick thoughts, you can just maybe maybe one minute. And anyone want to share about this? I, I think this uh this, this is this is key to fast adapting agents in changing environments. Yeah, you cannot have all agents with the same memory. Okay, all will die together if the environment changes. Thoughts on this, anyone? Okay, if not, let's move to the next one. The next one is uh, look ahead planning. So how to know which memory trajectory to, to use? Okay, right now, right now we are just mapping into sub goals and uh, taking the entire 
plan to that sub goal. But you know, if we don't really have the goals to, to use, we might need to use transitions to get us to start from start state to end state. And then you can use methods like uh, Monte Carlo tree search, basically some form of tree search to you know, get from start state to end state. And I think that is useful. So um, yes, we should do look ahead planning. Um, in this example, they don't have much look ahead planning because they can decompose all into sub goals. Um, maybe you can think of self check as a way of look ahead planning to make sure to, to look ahead and make sure plan works. But this is like more like a secondary kind of thing because they don't use it to generate the plan. The plan is usually generated like just from a, a successful trajectory and then you condition it. Uh, if you don't have successful trajectory, then um, you have to hope that the controller can get you there. Okay, so so that that is that is uh one of the the downfalls of Jarvis one. The controller itself may not be able to get you there. Right, if let's say you have a missing step in memory. Like from uh, iron pickaxe to diamond pickaxe, you know, you 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 may not know how to. So, for example, you want to find a diamond ore. Like you need to rely on the fact that your controller can get the diamond ore in this sub step. Okay, if if that sub step cannot work, then the whole system will uh, will fail. Right. So I I think look ahead is important, and uh, it's not really there in this paper, but some form of Monte Carlo look ahead using tree structure. I think this is useful for planning. And lastly, memory soup. Okay, memory soup is basically an idea that you store various forms of abstractions of memory in the same place. So I was thinking that you can store long and short term memory, like long term transitions, like for example, iron pickaxe to diamond pickaxe, and also like short term transitions, like, like for example, um, I don't know, uh, iron pickaxe to diamond ore. Yeah, so, so you can store different different kind of I mean even shorter terms shorter term ones will be like like maybe like uh left side of bridge to right side of bridge. You might you might also do the navigation part like that. So I, I do think if you encode the memory in different areas like that, you might be able to express plans at different levels of hierarchy, different scales and so on. And um Maybe this could help with uh, look ahead planning as well. So this is something I'm interested in. Uh, in fact, all these three are something I'm interested in. And um, unfortunately, all these three is also not done in this paper. So there's a lot of room for improvement for Jarvis one. But I do think they only hit like 10% of what can be done with memory. There's still like 90% more that, that can be done for an adaptable agent. Okay, if not, um, that's all I have for today. Thanks for listening. Uh, last comments before I close the session. Okay, if not, uh, thanks so much. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, yes, uh, what, what, um, do I have anything? Sorry, uh, did anyone speak just now? Yeah, yeah, John. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I wonder, right, um, because all these are learning from Wiki, correct? Uh, yes, yeah, so far it's in the Wiki, yeah, yeah for sub rules. And, yeah. And so I wonder. Week. Whether in future will LLM be able to self learn more by really exploring the situation, the landscape? Mm, I think LLMs alone cannot. Uh, what you need mm. to do, you need to have LLM with an exploratory mechanism. So, um, for example, what is an exploratory mechanism? Um, it could be something like a uh, helm based method. So, basically, if 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 you already know something, you don't you don't do it. It's like uh like you, you can you can do it um based on how many experiences you have in memory. So so if something like you know the chicken rice versus duck rice thing, like why why do we not want to eat chicken rice all the time? So I, I recently come up with an uh hypothesis. <laughs> uh is that we want to diversify our experiences. So it's like you, you don't want to just keep eating chicken rice. So somehow inbuilt in us, we have this method of diversifying our experiences. So we diversify the dark rice sometimes. Like um and sometimes maybe you eat other stiff things like um hamburger and so on. Yeah, uh, if we don't have this um inner method of diversifying, we will eat the same food 
all the time because why not, right? You just keep exploiting your 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 memory and and keep doing something that you know will work. Like you think about it, like if let's say you are very good at something, you know, shouldn't you want to keep doing the same thing again and again every day? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but but most people are not like that. Like after they master something, they get bored. They want to do something else. Yeah. Mm. So, so there must be some exploratory mechanism to diversify your experiences. If not, what will happen is you become like stuck at one particular task and you keep doing that task every day and uh you know that's not good for evolution right because you, you can't adapt that well you're only good at one task right. like with a cool. health eater yeah oh uh, sorry uh yeah uh what what what, what, do you, what do you say oh i said it's not good for health either if you keep you know doing the same thing and keep eating the same food yes correct but you realize there's a way to bypass this exploratory mechanism. And let me tell you how, all right? And the way is surprisingly, or I don't know whether it's not surprising for you, gambling, probabilities, okay? So if you keep changing the outcome by some probability, people will keep pressing the slot machine, you know? <laughs> so so to them, different experience. Right? Every time you press the slot machine, different output comes out. And, and and you don't know for sure what made you get that transition. You play blackjack, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. People find it very happy. So gambling is a play on our psychology to make us explore more, but to the benefit of the casino, of course. Yeah. So so I think this this, this is some uh, inbuilt mechanism to explore that is it, it is it, that, that is in us. And like gaming companies, the gacha boxes and so on, they exploit this psychology in order to to profit. But actually, LLM, they have this uh, tem- temperature, right? It's kind of inbuilt also. Yes and no. Because uh, the temperature, uh, you might be able to sample some tokens, but you won't sample everything. Like, mm. you, you you might be stuck in a certain set and you won't get out. But, but maybe, that's, maybe that's sufficient. Like, um, maybe we shouldn't want all agents to explore everything, right? you will just do the exploration in the population. Like, mm. if one person gets stuck at a certain set of tasks, maybe another person will cover another set. Then, as a population, you explore everything. I think that's possible also. Yeah, so what yeah. you said about using LM token probabilities to sample might be possible. Uh, it's just that I think you should still condition it on your memory. So your memory might form the context. Yeah, and then you you then choose what you want to do next. It's, it's very similar to the self-instruct part that we saw here. You see this self-instruct, we use the memory and then we choose the task. So maybe we let the LM choose the task, but um, you know you condition it on memory so that you have some basis. So I think what you say, Ray, Ray, could work using the token probabilities of LMs to do exploration. I think that's possible. If you prompt the LM, say, I want to diversify and stuff, yeah, sure, you might get the tokens to output that diverse tasks already. Right. Talking about this, right? Yeah, as we mentioned earlier, I think humans have this thing called u- utility, right? As utility increase, the there's a de- diminishing returns of the u- utility, which uh the LM it doesn't have yet. Yeah, so I'm thinking in future, maybe if someone wants to build something that's more human like, they could add this thing called. You utility. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. It's something like a reward, right? Like um you get yeah. certain Yeah. I no I, I say something that when you when you eat too much chicken rice, you get more and more bored. So the there's a diminishing returns of the ah, utility. Yeah. Okay. I think this you make it more human like that's where it encourages exploration or so, I guess. All right. No, so this is a philosophical thing already. Um, like, do we believe that we do actions just to maximize pleasure or maximize utility, or and minimize pain? That's that's this view of thought that wants to maximize uh-huh. pleasure, minimize pain, or utilitarianism is to maximize utility, like what you are saying. Okay, so mm-hmm. um, that's one view of thought, and I don't agree with it <laughs> because <laughs> because I think it's too hard for us to calculate utility for everything. Like you want to choose between 10 drinks, you need to calculate utility of all 10 of them. I think that's not possible. That's just too much effort. Uh, we are probably goal-directed beings. Like, mm. Yeah, that's, uh, 
the whole the whole concept of utility and also maximization equilibrium is really out of fashion in in now even in mainstream economics thinking i think is more focused on behavioral economics mm. which really relates to human behavior and and all the complexities you know comes along with it yeah, maybe I yeah. should do another session. I I have this uh, idea that uh, optimization is not going to lead us to intelligence. Like you can optimize, but you will get a very narrow intelligence. Like you can play go or chess very well, um, but that intelligence won't be able to adapt to your environment. Absolutely of... right. Yep. Oh, yep. And, and sometimes um, that that it sometimes that individual optimization, if you uh you know bring back to. Hawkins point of a thousand minds, you might end up into conflicts, right? Because if, when everybody tried to optimize in, you know, <laughs> you cannot avoid conflict. Yeah, definitely. Uh, everyone tries to optimize, you will definitely um, be worse off uh, as a whole. I mean, because if you optimize and you take away resources in a certain area, like, you know, large language models, now everyone wants GPUs. Everyone tries to optimize for GPUs. Definitely the environment will be worse off. Yeah, so so that that's the, I I mean that's one example. But um, more concretely is that if you optimize for something, you will necessarily lose out on things that could do other things. Like um, if let's say I I'm a farmer, I just keep farming rice and then I don't farm a uh, corn, then like if everyone wants to farm rice, eventually you know no one will do corn. Yeah, so so that is like, that's why I think the intelligence thing. It's more of a group thing. Like even in economics, like why do some farmers do farm uh farm rice and farm corn, some farm meat? It, it depends on comparative advantage. I, I quite like the idea of comparative advantage. It's more like you do what um you can do that other people are not. So it's it's a group thing, like based on what other people are doing, you also you you, you calibrate accordingly and do something else. And that may be like how we diversify as well. Because it's it's not gonna be worth it for everyone to do the same thing. Yeah. As in the, the diminishing returns is something that is uh that, that is true. Like everyone do the same thing, the the next few uh, entrants will get lesser and lesser of the share of the pie. Yeah, maybe that's how uh diversity is also. Um, so maybe what Ray said about utility, there might be some merit, like uh the merit as in in terms of like the resources you get. Um, you 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 may not get the resources enough resources to survive so it's not so much that you feel happy doing it but it's more like maybe your goal is to get food but if you keep doing this task you won't get food then you will change your behavior accordingly okay, i don't know what, what, I, what i'm saying is, make, is making sense and i'm just saying that the goal directed path can lead you to explore also because if your goal is to survive and get food then you know, you would you will diversify so that you cover areas that other people haven't done yet in order to to increase your chances of getting food. For example, yeah. I mean, you can think of it in terms of money also. Like we 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 work to get money, but why do you work your current job? Like why do you do your current job? Is it because you're very interested in your current job, or is it because you have some like comparative advantage that you can yeah? So so you can think about it like that. So in order to do your goal directed behavior, which is to earn enough to, to survive, you in the end you diversify as a population. Okay, I mean you may or may not diversify, but at least the idea is that um there could be some exploration in that sense as well. Not just the individual sense, but as a group sense, there could be exploration just by calibrating your goals according to what other people are doing. Um, John, could you comment a bit about uh, prom training in terms of uh, getting an LLM to um, you know, solve a complex task and uh, getting the LLM to break down a task into subtasks? Prom training, is it? As in, you want to do it, basically, you want to make the LLM solve simpler tasks, right? That's the yeah, for, for example, if you want it to build uh like in, in Minecraft you want if you wanted to build some structure but you the LM has to learn have has to um you know use some subtask for example uh, construction of a building may require uh getting blocks as a first task and then second task might be to construct 
uh, one wall and then later add more elements to the building. So yeah. how do you, um, what is the research saying about how do we form the, the LM to do okay. such tasks? I mean, most commonly is this a uh, chain of thought. And uh, the most common prompt is uh, let's think step by step. Um, however, I don't like this prompt because uh, let's think step by step lets the LM decide what steps it is. Uh, what is better is like if, if you could already know the sequence of thought. Like for example, uh, in my chat dev video, um, like you could form the product idea and you can go into like... Um, find the modality, find the type of code needed, like, like maybe for example, Python, then after that you could um go into like UI ideas and so on. So, so you could, like if you, I mean, they, over here they use the waterfall model to, to basically do the planning and so on. So if you really know what, what broad processes there is, it's better to prompt the LM to come up with the answer for each yeah. process, oh. it's sequential yeah. step. Yeah. 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 So yeah, I think that's more or less it um, in terms of like how to break it down into subtasks. If you can break down the process, that will be useful. Uh, within each oh, process... Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, sorry, um, Ray. Uh... Oh no, sorry, sorry. Yeah. So uh, if you could already break down each process into... Uh, you can also break down each process into sub-steps. And if you already know the sub-steps beforehand, that's even better. Or you can just ask the LF to think step-by-step, step, which... um may not work that well, <laughs> but the idea is you could break down a problem into concise sub-steps and ask the LM to solve it. Uh, in the Minecraft case, we can break down the problem like enchanting table into obsidian, diamond, and book, which we already know beforehand by the wiki. So um, if you could, in fact, this whole thing, this query generation, you know, you, you don't have to use an LM to, to do this, actually. You could just do this entire query. You can do this entire breakdown into sub-goals by rules, I mean, it's, it's totally rule-based. And uh, Ghost in the Minecraft does this by rules. I don't see why you you, you, you need to use, um, like in this case, memory to, to do this. Like uh, memory is later, you use it to extract out the stuff. But if you really can break down stuff by rules based on your domain type, you should just do it by rules. Why leave things to chance, right? LMs have some form of stochasticity, you know? So once you break down the rules, and then um, the other thing is you need to do this thing called a domain match. So it's like your query and your action space, the semantics need to match. Basically, um, you need to know that based on pattern matching to like some semantic words, you can already match to some actions. Like for example, I want to walk from point A to point B, or I want to like swim, you know, like walk is on land, swim is in water. You can say that walk is only for land tiles, swim is for underwater tiles. Yeah, so, so if you, explain this out in words you can match based on the game description and so on um, this will help the lm do the task better so the main idea is to split into subtasks and at the very very last subtask there must be a domain match so i, I hope i answered your question yeah yeah okay got it domain match that's interesting yeah Okay, if not, uh, I think that's more or less it for today. We exceeded quite a bit, but I, I like the discussion. And uh, I do think this Jarvis one paper is a, is a nice paper. The memory could be improved, but um, they did show that memory is important for learning. And the controller could be improved as well. <laughs> so um, it, uh, we, to just cap it off, I think this is a great advancement in terms of um, making real-life embodied AI. Yeah. Uh, eventually, we might find that Minecraft is not um, diverse enough and not adaptive enough for the real-world use case. But if we should solve Minecraft first, because Minecraft is easier, then we move on to more realistic environments. And uh, in all these environments, I believe memory will be the key. And storing transitions will be more important than storing task success, because you may not be able to just, um, define tasks in real life. And reflection to form longer sequences of um, of actions in order to solve some tasks, I think that will be useful. So memory in terms of transitions, reflections to form longer consolidated trajectories, and some form of search through a tree to link from start state to end state for any arbitrary start and end state. I think all this will be key to this kind of um, fast learning and adaptiveness. Uh, one other thing, the memory needs to be updated. Right now, they never update the memory. 
you need to update it with the latest environment transitions. Yeah. Or you could, okay, this is another topic. You could infuse emotions in your memory. So if there's something that changes, you could have surprisal and your surprisal encodes a strong signal of dopamine to encode that memory even stronger. So uh, more on that next time. Yeah, I, I do have a theory about emotions and memory and how, how it's used for learning. Okay, uh, that's all I have for today. Thanks for coming, and I'll see you all again next time. Okay, bye. Thank you. Bye.